Hey, it's up, Brass Facts here today. After my Jackal review, I got a lot of comments telling me to go ahead and review the Foxtrot Mic 15. So here we are. <laughs> Time for the review. The Air 15 M16 M4 starter design is an amazing design. No question about it. It's the standard we measure all other rifles to. However, there are certain things that the design comes up short with. Primarily the difficult to tune the system for different use cases, be it ammo type, suppressed usage, or the requirement for a fixed stock buffer system. It's marginally annoying, especially for hypothetical storage, vehicle borne operations, or most importantly, if you need to fit it in Instagram's overly restrictive aspect ratios. Now, you can somewhat tune the AR-15 via buffer weights, but generally that's more akin to trim control versus large sweeping changes required from when going suppressed to unsuppressed and back again, from a clean gun to a dirty gun. You can add pounds to your rifle via a law folder or something like it, but these are all very cattywampus. While we could go to an entirely new weapons platform, myself and many other people would like to keep AR-15 weight, balance, ergonomics, and more, while also potentially somehow getting a folding brace, stock, and having adjustable gas. There are thousands, no, it's, it's probably more like 10 to 15, but there's a large number of solutions coming out recently to kind of address this. My sweetheart solution is the bootleg adjustable BCG from, well, well, bootleg. It's an offshoot from PWS, Primary Weapon Systems. This allows us to keep a standard AR-15, exact same configuration, and put a slightly not mil-spec BCG in, and configure the rifle for suppressed, unsuppressed, whatever usage. I also have my hands on a piston gun from PWS, 9-inch 300 Blackout. This uh, retains much of the ergos, balancing, and weight of an AR-15, but this is very much in the land of proprietary weapon system, and we still don't have that folding stock. The Brand 180, also designed from PWS, uh, for Brennells in this case, while sort of being a retro gun, does fit the niche of having an adjustable gas folding stock AR-15-like design, and I'll, I'll be taking a look at one of them. They're kind of cool. But today, we're looking at the Foxtrot Mic 15, a purpose-built AR-15-like design that gives us our folding brace and our stock, side charging, and adjustable gas. Also, allegedly built by a former PWS employee. Man, they really have a chokehold on the market. It's a DI gun with OEM adjustable gas block, a system designed to facilitate a folding brace and or stock, mil no spec lower, and in fact, you can use a standard lower and buffer, Still though going. it's generally ill-advised, and then everything else is identical. Is this a case of having our cake and eating it too? But in essence, we have a piston gun feature set in a DI Air 15. Hey, go ahead and consider buying these patches. I wanted to give out patches at SHOT Show, but minimum orders are way more than 50 patches, so I have about 200 of these patches. So if you want to go buy one, I will have these available right up until SHOT Show, and then I'm going to get rid of the rest of them at SHOT Show. Buy these now, limited time, yada yada yada, support your creators, whatever. Okay, see you later. Real quick, if you're remotely interested, it's worth noting Foxtrot Mike sells this in a very weird way. They don't actually sell it on their website, instead opting ex for exclusivity, which is fine, a lot of manufacturers do this, but Rainier Arms is the only one selling the 12.5 variant, as far as I know. AIM Surplus sells the 11.5 variant, and I think Primary Arms and Brownell sell the rifle and 9mm variants. Maybe. I mean, I, I'm getting old, so I'm probably becoming tech inept, but it was really weird to find out who sold what. Regardless, you're spending about 550 to 650 for the upper, and maybe about 200 for the lower, which is a really good deal. If you can get it with a lower, go ahead and do that. That's not just cheap for a proprietary weapon, but that dabbles in the same cost category as a lot of the medium to budget AR-15. Hey, that's pretty good. So, how does a PWS on an Anderson budget do? What's up? I was gonna film this looking out the window, but uh, to be frank, I tried that and it overexposed everything because there's snow out there and everything's bloomed out wide as hell. But anyway, uh, I want to look at the, the function and um, kind of design of the Fuck Me 15, <laughs> the Fox Shot Mike 15. 
we call it the Fuck Me 15 because we're dudes and we see FM and we, we think fuck me, right? Nothing against the company, it's just funny. It's the Fuck Me 15. By the way, the Fox Shot Mic 15, how it works, how it's assembled. I have it on the lower that I wasn't using for most of the review, just to kind of show what I bought. You can buy this with the lower and upper. I just bought the upper so it would ship to my door. I also have a fuckload of lowers, so uh, I didn't really need another lower. But you get these two pieces in the packaging, and this screws into your buffer assembly, allowing you to have a Picatinny rail attachment for your brace and or folding stock. Nice. How does this thing work? We're gonna go tip to balls, balls to tip, nut to butt, tip to butt, whatever. First thing we notice is the very long, nice handguard that goes to full length. Remember, this is about a, this is a 12 five inch setup. It's technically a mid-length gas system, though I don't know if you can technically apply AR-15 logic to this. It's essentially a different weapon that has very strong similarities with a DI AR-15. But we have a mid-length gassed 12.5. Gas block wise, we have a adjustable gas. I'll be talking about that at great lengths coming up, so if we're gonna move past that. We have a side charging system. It is not only non-reciprocating like most designs, but it also has a spring. When it's in the locked or the low position, it will actually naturally come up. This is super useful because a lot of systems, while they're non-reciprocating, have no pressure applied to the charging handle. Thus, when you're shooting it, you'll see the thing flop up and down and hit you in the arms and stuff. The handguard and the barrel nut combination is pretty nice. It's a very large, chonky boy. Barrel nut on the inside, very impressive, very reminiscent of the Geisley ones, though it's, it is slightly different. Though it also uses a cross bolt to kind of secure it in place. For anti-rotations, we have this really nice thing to see on a, let's be real, a, a, a cheaper uh, rifle. We have this thing built into the upper receiver to act as an anti-rotational tab. And this honestly is, is far superior to most anti-rotational tab designs. So once again, good job there. The only, the only gripe is that maybe these screws stick out just a hair too far. You can see mine kind of get bashed up because I brace it off of objects and it's going to bump because it's the, the leading most edge. But really beyond that, not too big of a deal thus far. Moving rearward, we'll notice that the, the BCG, I'll throw on pictures, it's probably hard to see. The BCG has a small cutout on the rear, very reminiscent of maybe an AK or a Bren 180 or BRN 180. Bren 180, that'd be cool. You know, you know, Bren from Brownell, Brownells. No, the BRN 180 has a little gap here. Why? Because we don't have all of this uh, for our BCG to move into. So the BCG actually stops right fucking there and you have a spring assembly right here and above. So basically when the gun cycles, oh, this is gonna suck. When the gun cycles, this is a, speaking of which, this is a very uh, stout system because you're fully compressing the spring I'm showing it behind you. You're fully compressing the spring in this last little itty bitty bit. And as you can see, yeah, it's it's a tough boy. I have small amounts of gripes with openings like this. It's an Air 15, very heavily inspired design. And a big benefit of the Air 15 inspired design is that it fully seals. This doesn't fully seal. So when I was shooting uh, one of the days, very dry back then, right? Still in the summer, hot as dick whatever, you name it, Utah has a lot of dust and bullshit. So when you're shooting in the prone or the near prone, <clears throat> you're gonna get dust into the gun and I noticed my trigger go <laughs> because dust had gotten in, or more, more like small sand particles had gotten in, went into the trigger group and actually caused some very slight trigger freeze. That only happened once and the fact that, you know, AKs, the BRN-180, so on and so forth, all have a hole over here and they're not, you know, complete shit show disasters. It's a gripe, but it, it's not a deal breaker by any means. And then you obviously have the dust cover, which is nice. Worth noting, this dust cover is like, I don't know, out of spec or some shit, because it's, it's really hard to push in unless you, you kind of come at it from a very specific angle. So I don't know what's going on there. As I mentioned, and it's worth reiterating, this works with any mil-spec AR-15 lower. I wouldn't recommend it because I don't think it's meant to design to have give on the back over here. But maybe it is, you know, but you can run this one anyway. If it's low and I did, because I was a lazy kid. What the fuck? Are they scraping ice right now? Oh, he's, we're, we're salting. It's time to ruin the undercarriage of my car with copious amounts 
a fucking salt, and then I get too lazy to go to the car wash because it's always filled up, and then my entire car rusts into pieces. Awesome. Very nice. Some points to note. This, as a lefty, is very hard to actuate. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of pressure. As a righty, you have a lot more force. It's not hard at all. But as a crippled lefty that probably needs to be put down, I have issues, which is why, just to explain it, in the video, you see me move on to, instead of dropping the bolt like this, I actually come over the top like a handgun and rack it like that. I have a lot more force and it's much easier to do. It's also how I clear malfunctions. There also is a bit of raised height over here. I don't think it was really that noticeable when you run it with something like a standard AR-15 buffer height system. When you put a brace on, I did notice it slightly because my brace happened to sit a hair lower. Is it a big deal? No, you bought this. You're not me. You don't run 12 different rifles over the course of a year. You're gonna get used to it almost immediately. It's just a training thing. Don't worry about it. It's not actually that much higher, even though it looks like it's much higher. It's only a hair higher. I, I think it's about 0.3, give or take, or less. So noticeable, but not. Hello! Yeah. We like being held. Okay, so far, so good. If I could wave a wand and design an AR-15 that is meant for suppressed usage, this isn't too far of what I would have done. Except maybe the side charging aspect. I think the stoner rear charging handle is much more elegant out of the way until you need it. It's also far easy to mortar with it. But short of that, on paper, this seems pretty damn good. I've had this guy for about a thousand rounds. It's a bit low by my standards for a rifle or a weapon test, so apologies, but I think I have a pretty good idea of how this thing is gonna hold up long term and don't really need to shoot anymore. I also ran it suppressed for most, if not all, of the review with the dead met with the dead air Sandman S. I use 556 end cap, but it's an overboard can. So my performance may vary if you have a much, you know, higher back pressure 556 dedicated can. The general feel of the rifle is fantastic. It feels like a standard AR-15 with some modifications. We preserve balance, pointability, that's a word, right? And more of the weapon. I cannot understate this. I always come back to the M16 M4 AR-15 design because it's balance, recoil, impulse, how it really snaps on target compared to any other design. And of course, it's manual of arms. It really is the standard in these regards. So having that be the case here, while having added functionality, top points there. Durability and wear seem really good. While a thousand rounds are marginally more than a first looks, having this stripped down, inspected, cleaned all the parts, looked at the wear points, everything looks copacetic. No wager wear, no recoil trace, snapping in half, you know, the usual. Unfortunately, I had both gassing and reliability issues. Now it's worth stating, the gun community both thinks AR-15s can go thousands of rounds suppressed without cleaning and have perfect gassing all the while not having a single malfunction. This is not a thing, guys. I stress test a lot of weapons by not cleaning them for the total round count. I usually tend to lube them throughout because, you know, we gotta be somewhat realistic. I also tend to go to more than just a flat range. It's not a brag, it's just, there's a lot of mini dust particles, dirt debris, little stones and shit embedded in the sludge of the receiver just due to shooting in a non-sterile environment. Now, this isn't the most realistic condition to leave your weapon in. You're gonna clean it, but it's a good indicator of other factors. That being said, I did notice that the FM-15 had issues earlier than standard, and when it did have issues, they were more numerous and severe than other rifles that I've tested in my anecdotal experience of giving them similar treatments. So once again, while I didn't clean it for the review, I did relube it, and I would consider the performance here lacking compared to other similar systems. Starting out, I ran on the smallest gas setting because the middle of the three settings was horrifically overgassed initially with Tula 223 PMC, Fioki 62 grain, and 62 grain 556 Norma. On setting one, I got one malfunction on the range trip. Everything seemed good. Honestly, that, that's pretty standard. Then I went on a three-day shooting trip to really do the bulk of the testing and... All right, go ahead.
Five, five, six. Malfunction. Oh, malfunction. It's definitely overgassed. I'm feeling it, but we got another malfunction. Yeah, the gun up and died. It wouldn't really run with the brass. And midway through the drill, I switched to Tula because I, I ran out of brass. And the gun just up and keels over and says, please no more, sir. And then I keep going, so I get a middle finger and the gun has a stuck casing. At this point, I consider that a sign and move the rifle to the two out of three gas setting. So the middle setting, slightly more gas. It's now distinctly over gas with 556, as in you're going to get watery eyes and you're going to look like one of those e-tiktok girls with fake freckles after every rain trip, but instead of simps in your comments, you're going to get lead poisoning. Now, to be sure, still significantly better than an AR-15 with a suppressor slapped on the end and no adjustability, and definitely better than an SBR variant, which this would be. Well, it's a pistol, but y you know what I mean. So, not, not, as qu not quite as good as some of the other adjustable gas systems I'm running right now. I'm actually running several. Uh, so it doesn't do it quite as elegantly, but it does get the job done. Reliability is kicked up a notch. We're looking about six malfunctions. All of them, almost exclusively, are short stroke related. However, the majority of the ammo past this point was Tula, which does increase malfunctions. Not just because the ammo is less reliable, but because the rounds increase friction drastically. However, as you can see in the footage, I've also had malfunctions with the full power 5.56 loads, which should, in theory, mitigate a lot of these issues. Now, it's worth noting, four to six malfunctions is typically right on the cusp of what I would consider acceptable, and okay, we're beginning to have issues, and you could really go either way on that one. I would generally lean towards, it's just slightly higher than normal, but not anything to be worried about. Now, technically, I had one more gas setting, the three out of three wide open se setting with a suppressor. <sighs> I'm not that big of a fan of running on a rifle on a setting that requires the usage of a C-burn mask. I can run an AK if I want to do that. Unfortunately, the gas woes do not stop there. It's kind of a leaky boy, which may be indicative of some why these issues occurred, but the gas block design is somewhat underwhelming. The adjustment is stupidly hard to use. For some reason, it has this very shallow concave design that fits exactly zero to tools, and everything that you try to push off it will just slip off the edge due to the sloped design. It took a lot of muscle grease to get... What the fuck is a muscle grease? It took a lot of elbow grease to move this thing when I first got it. As in zero rounds, lubed, uh, we even put some more lubed on it, you name it. It was very difficult to switch it to the number one gas setting at the start of the review. After about two to 300 rounds, impossible! the gas block completely seized up. Now it's worth noting, basically all gas blocks on the market seize up like this. But it seems like this one really wasn't designed for that to be a possibility. You cannot achieve the required torque as the tools will simply slip off the, the, the you know, the design, the star-shaped design. And the end result is I need to take the rail off to use a crescent wrench combined with soaking it forever to move the damn gas block. There is a reason why the Jackal, the Brand 180, the PWS, and basically all gas piston systems use a gas block that has the ability to jam a tool in it such that it can't slip. Because you really need a lot of force to break a carbon lock that will occur. So yeah, in theory, it's got an adjustable gas block, but in practice, this is more of a set it at home and then forget about it kind of deal. Not something you can use in the field to get more gas into your rifle as, you know, the rifle conditions degrade, the lube dries up, or you drop a ham sandwich in the receiver. And that's actually mostly it. It's an iterative design on the Air 15. We have a very well-made weapon that brings up a lot of useful value to the table, but the gas system sort of fumbles it at the 10-yard line. The 5-yard line? I don't... 
I don't watch football. I, at some point, a ball was fumbled with the gas system at a line marker. And that ultimately is the crux and the issues with this firearm. It's by no means a bad firearm, but it doesn't quite nail it to get, you know, the perfect iteration of what this thing could be. Suppressed gas setting, the setting I would prefer to use with this firearm, doesn't really work with any loads. However, kicking it up a notch, we get a setting that does work. It's a hair over gassy, but that's acceptable. But then it's also let down by the fact that this isn't really an infield adjustable gas system, which is annoying. Simply put, there are other things that do this thing better. Now, here's the crux of it. None of them quite have the combination of features that this thing has, and none of them come in at this price tag. So this is absolutely a review where I have to softball the answer and say, hey man, it's going to be up to you to decide if this makes sense for you or not. And a big component of that is going to be the price tag. 600 700-ish dollars for an upper that has all of these features is hard to come by. Now personally, if I didn't want a folding stock and or brace, I would probably go down a different route. That's it. Uh, and it won't be the last of you see of this rifle. I'm gonna test out a lot of piston guns recently, got a new bunch in inventory, and uh, we're gonna compare a lot of them. Anyway, thanks for watching. Is that a doge? Hello? 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 What? What do you mean? Oh no. Did you poop in a meadow, Nova? Is that you?